Amen. Well, it is so good to have you with us today. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 6. That's on page 264, if you'd like to follow along in the Bible in the seat rack that's in front of you. As we're looking again at that wonderful story of Elisha. Elisha, an Old Testament prophet that ministered about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Now, Elisha is called the prophet of miracles. That's right, because over the last few weeks, we have seen a lot of miracles that God did through this uh, amazing man, Elisha. Well, this morning, we're going to see Elisha and the angel armies of God versus the armies of man. Now, you can just imagine what this story is going to be like. In fact, uh, speaking of armies, I found a funny little piece this week. Somebody collected a bunch of statements that they found in military manuals uh, and uh, about weapons and so forth. And so since we're talking about uh, armies today uh, and Elisha and the armies of God, I thought you might like some of these little uh, wisdom sayings called military wisdom uh, that they found on uh, some of these items. For example, in the Army's maintenance uh, magazine on preventative maintenance, it said this, a slipping gear could let your M203 grenade launcher fire when you least expect it. That would make you quite unpopular in what's left of your unit, okay? <laughs> ah, and I like these helpful instructions. This was printed on the side of a rocket launcher. It said this, aim towards the enemy, okay? <laughs> Very good advice, something that you want to do. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps manual had these in, uh, helpful instructions. It said, when the pin is pulled, Mr. Grenade is not our friend, okay? Kind of want to get rid of him there, you know? Uh, Infantry Journal said this, if the enemy is in range, so are you. Keep that in mind, okay? U.S. Air Force manual, this is the Air Force, it says this, it is generally inadvisable to eject directly over the area you just bombed, okay? <laughs> Try not to do that. Gets a, gets a little uncomfortable there. Infantry Journal said this, talking about the enemy. It said, try to look unimportant, talking about the enemy. They may be low on ammo, okay? So just, just look unimportant. I like this one, anonymous. It says, a ship can be a minesweeper once. So think about that one. Some of you that were in the Marine Corps, you may remember this one. It says, never tell the platoon sergeant you have nothing to do, okay? big mistake. And then uh, this last one, it says, don't draw fire, it irritates the people around you, okay? <laughs> oh, well. Well, this morning, Elisha is going to face the armies of Israel, or Elisha uh, will face the armies of Israel's enemies. And as he does, we're going to learn some important lessons about facing life's challenges and life's obstacles. So let's look this morning at God's word, 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. It says, now the king of Aram, his name was Ben-Hadad, was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God, talking about Elisha. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Well, once again today, we meet Ben-Hadad. We talked about him last week. The king of Aram, or Syria, as we know it today. Syria, of course, in this map here, is Israel's neighbor to the northeast. See that big, kind of that pink blob? That's, uh, that's Syria up there, you know, kind of to the northeast. And back then, it was called Aram. And uh, Israel and Syria or Aram would kind of go back and forth between having times of peace and times of war back and forth. Last week, we saw how during one of the times of peace, the king of Aram sent his general, a man named Naaman, uh, who had the disease of leprosy, to Elisha. And God, in a miraculous and an amazing way, healed this Assyrian general. Now some time has passed, and apparently Ben-Hadad the king has forgotten this kindness that Elisha and the Lord did for this military commander. In fact, somebody said, we remember our problems for years and years and years, but we quickly forget a blessing of God in just a few hours or days. You ever notice that? Boy, we can remember most. Well, apparently, um, this king did not remember 
this kindness that was shown, and in spite of Elisha's greatness or graciousness, Aram decides to go and be at war once again with Israel. And so they start sending in groups of armed bandits, armed soldiers, to, to rob the villages and burn and kidnap. But there's only one problem. When these bandit soldiers go in, they're not having much success. Because every time the king of Aram would make a move and try to set up his camp and to make his secret attacks, the Lord would tell Elisha what the Syrians' plans were, and Elisha would turn around and tell the king, and he'd tell all the generals of his armies. And so this, uh, this uh, Aramian uh, general was having all kinds of problems. Now imagine, those of you who served in the military, if the Lord was whispering to you every time you went into battle, telling you what to do and when to fire and that sort of thing, that's what's happening in our story today. God is clearly guiding Elisha, and he keeps warning him about what this king of Aram is going to do. And it says in verse 11, this enraged the king of Aram. You can imagine why. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? In other words, who's being a traitor to me? Who's spying and telling the king of Israel my plans? Verse 12, none of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Wow. Now this right here, my friends, should have told Ben-Hadad something about Elisha and about his God right here. He should have said, hmm, something's going on here. Because I tell you, a king's bedroom, archaeologists have found, was in the remotest part of the palace where only his very closest servants could go and only a very select group of people. But the Bible tells us that God's spirit is everywhere. It's everywhere, and, and, and the Bible tells us he knows your secret thoughts. He knows your private actions. He knows what you are doing when nobody else knows. He's watching you. In fact, he knows and hears every comment. Psalm 139 tells us, before we even speak a word on our tongue, God knows it all. And so the servant tells the king that the Lord is revealing to Elisha even the words this king is speaking in his bedroom. In fact, I'm going to guess that probably got him a little bit nervous, you know, and some eyebrows probably bent up, and a uh, few guys, oh, hey, we want to hear more about that, you know, hard to say. But it says in verse 13, the king goes, go find out where he, where Elisha is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Well, if you look at a map of Israel today, you'll notice that that black arrow, Dothan, is right in the middle of Israel, just about 10 miles north of Samaria. And so they send the soldiers there to Dothan, and it says in verse 14, then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And all of a sudden, Elisha and his servant are up against a pretty big obstacle, you know? In fact, I'm going to guess when they went to bed the night before, chances are they had no idea what would be waiting for them when they opened the curtains that next morning. You know, but they probably just thought, hey, it's just going to be another day, you know? And now Elisha's new servant, uh, the old one last week, Gehazi, he'd already taken off. Uh, this new servant gets up, and he sees a sizable army surrounding them. It's kind of like that, uh, that uh, great theologian Gomer Pyle used to say, surprise, 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 you know? <laughs> Pastor Mike, you just dated yourself. Thank you. I know that. All right. <laughs> But that brings us to the first point this morning. Number one, we got to recognize, my friends, problems and challenges will inevitably happen. Nobody is exempt. In fact, most obstacles and problems happen just like this. They come upon us unannounced. In fact, the enemy of our souls, just like the enemy here of Israel, is, is very active. Life just happens. Uh, Jesus was very realistic about this. He told us in John 16, he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Things go wrong at work. You get disappointed sometimes. You get sick. You get sad. Uh, ever notice how those obstacles sometimes come at the worst moments, you know, when you don't have time or when you're not prepared? I mean, have you ever had a flat tire that came at a good time? I never have. 
It usually waits till it rains or it's snowing or something like that. And if we're not careful, we're going to be just like this new servant of Elisha who says, oh, my master, what shall we do? In other words, our flesh, our emotions just sort of jump in with a, and, and that first response is panic and, and we often act rashly or impulsively or even foolishly. It's at this critical stage, though, when that first hits that we need to do the second thing. Number two, stay in control of your emotions. That's what Elisha did. He says in verse 16, he says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. In other words, he says, don't worry. Don't fret. Don't act on impulse. Don't do something crazy. Don't be afraid. Get a hold of your emotions. Because you know what I found, my friends? Is that when we panic, like at that first moment, the longer we allow those emotions to get the upper hand and fill our mind, the harder it is for us to hear reason, to hear God's Spirit speaking to us and God's Spirit guiding on our, our thoughts. In fact, I'm going to guess this servant's heart rate, it's probably going about 220 a minute right now. But old Elisha, he's probably cruising at about 60 beats a minute. He doesn't even break a sweat. In fact, it kind of reminds me of David in the 23rd Psalm. David talked about what happens when you go through life's dark valleys. He said, even though I walk through the valley of de the shadow of death, I will not what? What does he say? Fear no evil. Yeah. The good news, my friends, is a valley is something that you'll walk through. You don't stay at it in your entire life. It's something you go through. It's a circumstance. It's a situation. It's something that has a season to it. And, and when you're in that valley, part of you, you flash your emotions. Man, they just want to panic and think, oh, this is a dead end, you know. I, I'm stuck, but it's not. Think of a valley more like a tunnel. You go through a tunnel, and eventually you're out on the other side and back out in the light again. In fact, one day, here's the good news, if you know Christ, you're going to be in heaven, and there are not going to be any more dark valleys or tunnels or, or obstacles or anything like that, amen? All right. But it depends on where you put your faith and your focus. This servant, you know, he saw the Syrians, and he cries out in fear, but Elisha Instead, does the third thing that we need to do when we face life obstacles. Number three, he makes a bold statement of faith. Look what he says. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are what? More. What's it say? Those are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, and it says, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked. And he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, angelic beings, warrior angels, chariots of fire, you know. Da, 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 da. You know what I'm saying? God's watch care all around him. All the resources that Elisha needs are right there for him to face that situation and those armies of Aram if he needs to. In other words, God's in control. He, he's mightier. He's more powerful. He outnumbers those who oppose Elisha. And likewise, my friends, if you know Christ, God's watch care is over you. He has everything that you need to face that situation. The right words, the right actions, even the resources. When you face a test like this, the question is, who are you going to trust? And how are you going to act? Don't be afraid. Because God is with you in that situation. And he is far greater and mightier and powerful than those things that are surrounding you. And Elisha boldly declares that truth. Those who are with us, he said, are greater than those who are with them. In fact, in those times, uh, uh, the bold statement that I like to make when, when I'm facing those times of doubt might be just a faith prayer. I just make a statement to the Lord in prayer. I just said, Father, I thank you that you're greater. I thank you that you're on the throne right now in what I'm going through. I thank you that you're, you're bigger than this problem. And I thank you, Lord, that you've got all the resources for me to face what I'm facing and that this doesn't surprise you, God. And, and God, I just want you now, uh, like, uh, like Elisha's sermon, to open my eyes so that I can see the opportunities, so I can watch you guide me, so that I know those resources that you've already got there ready to help me with. Thank you, God. Those who are with me are greater than those who are with them. 
Now notice in our text, once this declaration is made by Elisha, that's when the power of God starts to reveal itself. Not before, but as he declares his faith. And Elisha prays, and this servant sees the armies of God, these angelic hosts. Now people read this sometimes and they say, well, Pastor Mike, does God sometimes send his angels to protect us even today? Well, what do you think the answer is? Absolutely. Yes, he does. Angels have a special role in protecting God's people. Now, you may recall when Daniel was cast into the lion's den over in Daniel chapter 6. Remember how God protected him? The Bible says that, that the king who, who was kind of forced to throw him in that lion's den, he was up all night pacing back and forth. But that next morning, he gets up and he goes, he rolls the stone away and he looks in there and he said, Daniel, Daniel, uh, did your God protect you? Are you okay? He was getting kind of scared. And it says in verse 22, Daniel says, my God sent his angel, sent his angel, sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. And they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Now, does God send his angels to protect us sometimes? Sure he does. Sure he does. As a Christian, God has a task for you to do. He's got a, a mission for you to do in this life. And if something in the external or the unseen spiritual world might somehow get in the way and keep you from fulfilling that task, God's going to step in. Maybe send some angels. Maybe the angel of the Lord. Well, Daniel had a call from God. He, he was a righteous man. He had a job to complete from the Lord. And even in a den of hungry lions, God preserved him. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes you're going to get sick or you're going to go through hardships. God sometimes allows those, those things in your life so that you'll grow and stretch you and make you more like Christ. But your days and your hours are in God's hands. Remember that. And God's angels, they often operate behind the scenes. And, and they help us accomplish the tasks that God has us to do. And most of the time, we might even not know when they stepped in on our behalf. Uh, once in a while, we might suspect it. You know, man, I just avoided a traffic accident there. Or, you know, a serious situation. Wow, how did that happen? Um, but it happens. Those angels work so often behind the scene. People say, well, well, can I pray that God will put his protective angels around someone? And the answer is, why not? Bible doesn't tell us we can't. Bible says, you, you know, sure, we, there's no problem with that. You can pray, Lord, surround my son, surround my daughter, uh, protect them on this trip. Put your holy angels around my children or my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren or my wife or my husband and protect them. Uh, scripture, does tell, scripture tells us we can't do that. Sure we can. Well, realizing that God is on the throne and that those who are with him are greater than those who are with the enemy Elisha just kind of steps out. Man, he is confident. He's ready to go. And it reminds us of the fourth thing that we do after we make that bold statement and affirm God is in control. That brings us to four, number four. Step out trusting God to move. In other words, recognize problems will come. Stay in control of your emotions. Make that bold statement of faith. God, you, you're with me in this. And then step out trusting God to move. And that's what Elisha does, doesn't he? I mean, he walks out of that gate of the city. He walks up to the armies, and he faces them boldly. He's stepping out. He's trusting God. God's power is among him. And at just the right moment, God moves. Elisha isn't being foolish. He isn't being impulsive. But after a praying and affirming, God, you're in control. I'm trusting you. It, uh, God moves. In fact, Psalm 16, verse 8 tells us this. It says, I've set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let's read that verse together. It says, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Hallelujah for that. And so Elisha steps out. He's trusting God. And you'll notice in this next verse, God moves at just the right time. Verse 18, as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike them with blindness. Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Wow, pretty incredible. In fact, the Hebrew idea for blindness here is the idea of loss or distortion of vision or mental confusion or bewilderment. God just steps in at just the right time 
and he takes charge of the situation. Elisha walks up to this group of army men. They're kind of groping around doing this blind man thing. And it says in verse 19, Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. That was about 10 miles up the road. Verse 20, after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. Now, talk about shockers. Talk about feeling on the spot. I mean, this would be like stepping out of your shower and discovering that the whole town is there to greet you, you know. You feel a little exposed, you know. You, you, You feel a little vulnerable here. Uh, You weren't expecting this, and that's exactly what we see. Here's this big city surrounding them, the walls, the armies of Israel with their swords drawn, and they're kind of in the middle. Uh Uh-oh, you know, a good time for those guys to learn to pray. And it says in verse 21, when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, oh, shall I kill them? My father, shall I kill them? I mean, he is so excited. I mean, this is the opportunity to wipe them out. God has just put the enemy on, the, on his platter, and this king is ready to eat. But Elisha says this in verse 22, Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? No, Elisha says, do the right thing. Uh, you don't walk by faith and trust God until things start to improve and then say, all right, God, I'm going to take it from here and do things my way. No. But as the Lord moves, Elisha shows us, you number five this morning, persevere in faith and you do the right thing. So when life's problems hit you, you got to recognize problems are going to happen. You stay in control of your emotions. You make a bold statement of faith. Man, I'm trusting God. You step out in faith and trust God. And as God starts to move, you persevere. You keep doing the right thing. You see, it would have been so easy to have killed these captured soldiers. But Elisha does the God-honoring thing. And even now, when things are going pretty well, he stays faithful. Don't kill the prisoners of war, he said. Instead, let's show these guys the mercy and the grace of the God of Israel. Let's give them a little demonstration of God's goodness that they are never going to forget. And look what happens. Look what he tells King Joram of Israel. He says, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. (laughs) Really? Verse 23. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Haram stopped raiding Israel's territory. I can believe it now, can't you? Well, what happened? Elisha overcame evil with good. That's right. Somebody said, I love this uh, this quote in this next slide, love your enemies, it'll drive them nuts, you know? (laughs) That is so true. Well, is Elisha doing some strange, weird, novel, psychological ploy here? No. He's just living by God's word. Proverbs 25, uh, 21 says these. Let's read it. It says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. I like what John MacArthur writes. He says this in his commentary. Heaping burning coals on his head refers to an ancient Egyptian custom in which a person who wanted to show public contrition or repentance, in other words, carried a pan of burning coals on his head. The coals represented the burning pain of his shame and guilt. When believers lovingly help their enemies, it should bring shame to such people for their hate and animosity. You see, Elisha was just doing the right thing, persevering in faith, giving them this great feast, was was showing them his confidence and God's ability to take care and control this enemy of Israel, and and to show the people you've got nothing to fear as long as you're walking with the Lord. Furthermore, here's an interesting little piece of information. Um, In the ancient Near East, when you would eat together under one roof, it it was signifying a covenant of peace. And so now that these Aramean enemies have eaten with the Israeli soldiers, they're now bound by social custom not to attack a friend. 
who has extended this gift of hospitality and protection. And it says at the end of this verse, for this reason, the Arameans stopped raiding Israel's territory for a time. Now I tell you, my friends, uh, most of the time, it's so easy to hang on a gr onto a grudge, isn't it? Or withhold a kindness to someone who, who has done us wrong. And you know, when I read these verses and I go, you know, that's pretty hard to do. It really is. And, and I think we all struggle with doing this kind of thing, showing kindness and mercy to those who have been hateful or mean to us. But you know, once in a while, I get it right. Once in a while, I get this from I remember years ago, I, I had heard a sermon on this, and I was back in eighth grade. And back in eighth grade, there was a kid who was always harassing me in, in, our, in, our, in our locker room in PE class. And this kid in my PE class would always call me names and put me down. Well, I'll tell you, back then I was kind of short. And, you know, being short in junior high or middle school, you had to learn to get to be pretty clever and run pretty fast so you could avoid those kids that were bigger than you, you know. Well, well one day uh, I was next to this, this guy who was always harassing me. And uh, I noticed that he forgot to lock up his baseball mitt in his PE locker and had left it on the bench and taken off to class. Well, my first reaction was, ha, too bad, kid. That'll be gone by the time the next group comes in, you know. And then I think I got sort of nudged. No, don't do that. And I remembered this principle. And even though I wasn't sure I wanted to, I stuck his mitt in my locker. Well, the next day, we're, we're getting our PE clothes on, and, uh, and I didn't say a word. I just watched this guy. And I noticed he's starting to look through his locker and pulling stuff out, you know, and looking around and, and under the bench, you know. I'm kind of enjoying this, you know, watching him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And finally, I said, um, are you looking for your baseball mitt? And he looks up in surprise like, how do you know? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, here, uh, you left it out yesterday, and so I put it in my locker so it wouldn't get taken. Now, I tell you, my friends, the look of shock on his face was a Kodak moment. <laughs> I mean, hey, I would have loved to have had a picture at that point. And all of a sudden, some of those burning coals were starting to cook on his forehead. And finally, he kind of hangs his head and he says, thanks. And he walks away. You know what? That guy never bothered me again. Wow. You know something? God's word works. Don't you agree? God's word works. And, and you see, in life, you got to remember, there are always going to be obstacles, but we don't need to panic at those times. Instead, in those moments, declare your faith in God. God, you're in control even now. And after you declare that, if you're trusting as you're walking, step out in faith and trust him to move. Keep trusting. Persevere. Do the right thing. And I'll tell you, my friends, God's going to bless you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you so much.